muted there, so it will be fairly <laughs> one-sided conversation. Oh. Hello, Naomi. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Hello, Evelyn. You're Missing muted. Tuesday. I uh, think we're all muted apart from you and me at the moment. Ah, okay. Wow. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce you, Michael, and then there's three dedications, and then I'll hand over to you, okay? Okay, perfect. All right. Our guest this evening is Rabbi Michael Pollock. He's speaking on understanding mental health through Jewish sources. Rabbi Michael Pollock teaches philosophy at JFS and is Page's secondary school coordinator. At Nair, he is the Datayomi Magid Shir, whilst he is a regular T and Torah contributor at Raleigh Close. There's three dedications this week. Uh, Lili Nishmat El Kachana Bat Pinkas Yehoshua, Devrona Lavracha, Anne Molman, whose yacht site is Rish Chodesh Tammuz, first of Tammuz, and was a regular attendee at the Shir. Secondly, Lili Nishmat Hillel Tuvia Ben Abraham Chaim, Devrona Lavracha, whose yacht site is today. And thirdly, Lili Nishmat Miriam Bat Ben Yamin, Devrona Lavracha. Mother of Nanny Landy and Ruth Pollock, whose yacht site is the sixth of Thomas. Uh, over to you, Michael. And if Michael, if you want to mention that people can put questions in chat or whatever, right. you, I'll leave that for you. Right. Um, good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so, um, first of all, just a procedural point. Um, if you can hold questions till the end, that's probably a lot easier. But if you do have a, a, um, a burning question, if you could put it on chat, I'll try and keep an eye on chat. I think Rabbi Portnoy said he'll try and keep an eye on chat. And if there's anything that's, that's really devastatingly unclear, I'll, I'll, I'll try and respond to it during the course of the talk. So first of all, um, can, uh, just a complaint. Um, my uh, CV wasn't read out as given. Um, the, the CV that I gave pointed out, and very uh, appropriately, as, as the, uh, what, what the, the spons part sponsorship of the evening is in memory of Ruthie and Naomi's mum, that my, my CV stated that I'd married into a very eminent and saintly um, Anglo-Jewish family, and Naomi had felt it inappropriate to read that out herself, so I thought I'd add that into my CV at this stage. So what I the, um, the the skeptics out there will point out that um, I don't have a long track record, or there's no points in my CV that would um, indicate that I have any expertise in mental health at all. And um, by what right am I going to talk about it? Well, the answer is the second part of the title in Jewish sources. Um, again, I don't have any special expertise, but I can make my way around Jewish sources a little bit. So it's the Jewish sources part. Um, that I'm going to, to emphasize. And the problem that I'm going to, to, to try and explain and try and find an answer um, is the following problem. That when we see bad things happening in our lives, we're expected to try and respond on a spiritual plane. So even when someone has a physical illness, we make, make a mishaberach, we, we daven refa'enu, um, and all the more so um, when someone has a, a, a non-physical illness, some mental difficulty, all the more so it seems to, to us intuitively that there's something spiritual going on. And how do we make the right balance? Because clearly it's not enough to say, let's dove and, and it will be okay. But then on the other hand, it would be wrong to say, well, as religious Jews, we'll ignore the fact that there is a spiritual element to this. And how do we draw, how do we draw the balance, um, particularly um, today, when we're looking at an explosion, really, unfortunately, of, of, of mental illness? So I'm going to share my screen, and you're going to see um, some material that I've put together. Um, I hope it, it sort of becomes reasonably clear. So when I was contemplating this overlap between spiritual explanations and physical explanations, 
even when it comes to physical illness, that we try and sort of fetch in a spiritual aspect that maybe something spiritual is going wrong. And I was looking for a good example. Um, the Vishnitsa Reva, bless him, came out with the following on Shabbos. Uh, I wasn't recording him on Shabbos, but it was written up after Shabbos. This is what he said. This is the Vishnitsa Reva. You, those of you on the ball will now know that there's about 13 Vishnitsa Revas as a result of um, a couple passing away over the last uh, three passing away. Uh, the three have been replaced by 13. This is Rabbi Yisrael Hager of B'nai Brak. And he's now going to explain the coronavirus in spiritual terms. This is hot off the press. This was at the Shalashudas in B'nai Brak on, on Shabbos. And um, I'm sure he didn't do this in Ivrit, so I'll try and read this in Ashkenaz as, as best I can. Forgive me, I haven't translated it, but I'll translate as I go along. So he said, what I have to say now, I'm saying because of a feeling of responsibility I have for the Jewish people. And I request that all those people listening, spread this message to anyone in, uh, in, within the Jewish people. In other words, an important message. And although it's uh, and you can't write it down, please try and remember and it hit the various Israeli blogs um, and the Haredi newspapers on Sunday. What did he have to say? He says as follows. Even though we might have thought that the coronavirus had come to an end, unfortunately, who are dying lava in Ha'olam, it's still around. Even though it's virulence, has weakened, Bisayata Dishmaya, with the help of God. Ladavonenu, sadly, Hatkufa Hazois, this period of the coronavirus, Hivia Ima, Pritsut Rabot Bahomat Hashmira, a lot of infractions and infringements in the degree to which we are careful, Mikli Hamashis Hatechnologim in using um, tech. So he says, as this virus came, so more and more people were reliant on tech, and that's terrible. And we're not going to shake off this virus. We're not going to be able to cure this virus without curing the underlying cause, which is our reliance on social media, um, email, computers, and he says very clearly, and he says, I want everyone to know this. If we can pull ourselves away from this reliance on um, these impure instruments, that will solve the problem of the virus in the world. If we could somehow stop and free ourselves of the virus, then we're going to be okay. Now, I, I don't suggest for a minute that any of us are entirely sympathetic with what he's saying, but it's not unreasonable for a rabbi to say that. Um, he's saying, as a great Hasidic leader, I need to identify the spiritual causes of illness. And you may think my, my identifying it with the use of tech is a little bit, um, uh, 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 scared to say irrational, but let's say irrational. Uh, nevertheless, you know, that you, you can't run away from the fact that as Orthodox Jews, we should be ascribing spiritual causes, even to physical illnesses. So with that in mind, I'd like to have a look at how certain people in their approach to spiritual illness as well, have taken the view that, um, sorry, with regard to mental illness, that mental illness is primarily some kind of spiritual failing. We'll try and have a look at that and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the ending, but we're going to see that there is an alternative opinion, which is much more balanced. But to understand how radical the balanced view is, I think we need to have a look at those people who, who say that largely mental illness is a spiritual failing, and then we'll see why that's wrong. 
So this is an amazing document that we have here. Um, it's, it's on that background because that was, um, it, this is a, a, a reconstruction of a photo of, this is a document that went up in Lakewood some, I think four or five years ago. And, um, and it asks the question that we, the, the Lakewood's a, a wonderful city full of yeshivot and, and learning institutions. Um, and the authors of this thing say, Mikasadom Hayinu, have we become like the wicked city of Sodom, La Amora Diminu? And have we even be, maybe we've become like uh, Gomorrah, where, where we've turned away from the right way of doing things? So it's obviously something very awful has been going on, something terrible. And he says, Zachta Irenu Hakdosha Lakewood, our holy city of Lakewood has become liot pninat hakete shel Torah, has become the summit of, of Torah and yirat shamayim, the chesed ba'atzot habit. We are the place where if people look for, for true Torah Judaism, they look at Lakewood. However, it's all gone wrong. And why is it gone wrong? Um, so if we skip a couple of lines, What's gone wrong is that Atan Nit, oh, sorry, I can't do this in Sfad, it has to be the Atan Nisfasem Bechola Olam. Everyone now knows what's been going on in, in Lakewood, what's been going on. Asher Avre Chuval Ba'azikim, a young man was dragged off in chains, Lesoch Rechev Hapolis, into a police car, Kaposher Shofel, as a lowly criminal. What's the backstory here that this is referring to? So um, unfortunately, it was a case of um, a wife who had been very badly abused by a husband, but had been told by her family that that's the way things go and she just ne needs to stick with it and it'll all get better. Um, she was introduced to um, some people who took a different view and felt that she was suffering to a degree of illness and that she was suffering from what we should call mental, mental abuse and mental illness. And the sooner she gets out of this abusive relationship, the better it's going to be. Now, and the author of this document is saying, that's terrible. It's up to rabbis to make those decisions. How can you allow um, mental health professionals get in? This woman is suffering there's no mental health issue. She's suffering from a spiritual failure to understand her role within, within the marriage. Um, so we can just very briefly see who, who is to blame from the worldview of the authors of this thing. Well, um, certainly a little bit of spelling lessons might have helped the author, but it's apparently people called therapists, that people who present themselves as experts in, in the field of mental disorder, these therapists, they're causing all the problems because they're telling her that what she's putting up with is pretty terrible and is causing her illness. And these people need to get out of town. And what becomes even more clear, it's not any old therapists, it's a particular gender of therapists, which you can see here, the therapistiot, it's female therapists who are causing all the problem. And what problem are they causing? They're persuading women not to have to put up with abuse that leads to mental illness. And um, they carry on in this, in, in, along these lines, and they say, with, with a heavy heart, since we're dealing with powerful enemies here, um, and they've even got the rabbis to fall in line. Um, uh, it's put the husband in, a, in, in an awful place. And that's where we're stepping in. The rabbis aren't going to help because they've been um, persuaded by the therapistiot. By, the, by, these, by these women, um, and we're going to have to stand up. And uh, towards the end of this document, they tell us who the main villains are. Um, poor old Golda Yaroslavitz comes at the head of the list, and she runs something, again, spelling not, isn't their strong suit. 
she runs something um i'm just wondering is there an american spelling of behavior without a u perhaps perhaps there is but anyhow so she runs something called behavioral health which is very much in their crosshairs and a whole load of other people who are similarly uh, therapists of one kind or another so that's obviously you may may say well that's a little bit off the wall um that's surely not typical there is no you know is that really what people think and um it's not so off the wall this idea that that mental illness is a spiritual ailment and needs to be dealt with as such goes back to to the Gemara and um in the Gemara we have this is a Gemara in Chagiga and it's discussing whether there's such a thing as sadness or weeping in the fe when you're with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So, is there such a thing as weeping before the Holy One? Or is there um, such a thing as depression if you really have a relationship with God? And the Gemara says that Rav Papa said, there is no such thing as depression. And the word here is in Hebrew is atzibut, which is um, the translation is very fair. We're saying there is no de 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 depression doesn't exist before the Holy One, blessed be He. If you truly are in a strong relationship with Hakadosh Baruch Hu and you are in in front of Him, whatever that means, then there is no place. There's no need for depression. Um, and the, the Pasuk says, Hod fanav, oz that when you are in the presence of God, there is only Hod honor and majesty and strength and beauty. In other words, if you want to um, cure depression, says the Gemara, the way to de cure depression is to find yourself standing in the presence of Hashem, and then you'll find that um, the depression melts away. Um, now, we are going to see very opposite, very opposite views in, um, in the Gemara. So I'm not presenting that as the only position that's, that's available. Um, but that is certainly a bona fide position. And largely, the group of people who take this position on most strongly, I think it's fair to say, is the in the Hasidic world, because the power and importance given to the Rebbe means he must really be able to solve problems, not only mental health, but he's also got to solve physical health problems. So if you go to him with, with a mental health problem and he refers you on to a psychiatrist, certainly until recently, that would have been a failing on behalf of the Rebbe. So we see Te Hasidic text after Hasidic text, certain, uh, eliding the idea that if you're suffering from depression or anxiety, there's a spiritual solution to it. This, in particular, the one I picked up here as, a, as, as an illustration is Rav Nachman of Breslov. So obviously Rav Nachman of Breslov is very famous for his idea that we need to concentrate on being happy the whole time. But um, this this never-ending happiness is really a sort of behavioral solution to problems of depression. Pretend you're happy, pretend you're happy, and guess what? You'll become happy. Um, and that, that opportunity to rejoice in what we have and what Hashem has given us is the solution, as far as Rav Nachman is concerned, to the problem of, of mental health. So... Um, Naomi, I'm really sorry to do this to you, but could I ask you to be Rav Nachman of Breslov? Um, I have a very lovely translation for you. No, um, no, and, please ask Evelyn. Ask Evelyn. Evelyn, do you feel ready to be Rav Nachman of Breslov? Oh, she's, she's muted. Um, I've got two red lines have appeared. Yeah, okay. A yes. broken heart and depression are not the same thing at all because a broken heart, depression Sorry, I... comes from the side of evil and is hated by God. But a broken heart is very dear and precious to God. 
CF Psalms 5119. The sacrifice to God is a broken spirit. God will not despise a broken, shattered heart. It will be very good to be broken hearted all day. But for the average person, this can easily degenerate into depression. You should therefore set aside some time each day for heartbreak. You should isolate yourself with a broken heart before God for a given time. But the rest of the day, you should be joyful. So this is Rav Nachman of Breslov. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Um, writing, he's a grandson of, um, he's writing at the end of the 18th century. Um, he's a grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. And he's very clear. He's saying there's such a thing as broken heartedness. And that's a reasonable reaction to some of the events in our lives. And we should devote an hour of each, each day to very sad and tragic reflection on the bad things that are happening in our lives and in the world. But we mustn't let that out of control. That's a sort of, and it's almost an affectation in, in uh, Rav Nachman. You need to concentrate on being broken hearted, but then when the alarm clock goes, end of an hour, you really need to snap out and you need to start the rest of the day, you should be joyful. And depression comes from the side of evil and is hated by God. So the cure for depression is avoiding evil and getting closer to God. And maybe there's even a catharsis in this one hour broken heartedness, fully controlled, it's going to stop after the 60th minute, and then you're going to be able to, to, to move on from there. And I certainly, I, I had five other Hasidic texts that were saying pretty much the same thing, that um, what we identify as depression and anxiety in particular, and behaviors such as, which we would call something like schizophrenia, those are all spiritual failings and a, a Rebbe or a spiritual guide will, will get you out of it. So I'd like to show you there's a completely alternative view. And the alternative view, um, unsurprisingly, is is paraded by the Rambam, by Maimonides, who himself was a doctor. Um, so you would expect him not to be very skeptical about how successful medicine is. And he's going to explain a completely different approach to mental, mental health problems. And we're going to see how his thinking has influenced the application of the halakha in, in these areas. And let me just, before we go into, let me just, uh, 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 the famous anecdote is told that um, Shari Tzedek Hospital was established in 1902 by a very eccentric but very orthodox uh, yekka called Dr. Moshe Valach, I suppose Moshe Valach would, would be the way he'd like to be pronounced. Valach was everything in the hospital. He was the surgeon, he was the chemist, he was the uh, diag diagnostician. He was, uh, um, well, I hope it wasn't cradle to grave, but he, he saw you through your experience of the hospital, including surgery. And one of the disarming things he would ask you, and he was the anesthetist as well, one of the disarming things he would ask you before he, he, he applied the anesthetic was he would ask patients what their mother's name was. And they would want to know why he needs to know the mother's name. And he would say, because I'm going to say to heal him for you before the operation. Um, and not all patients um, felt that they were in the best hands if the surgeon needed to say to heal him before, before the operation. But that was his thing, that they, he's got to do the operation, and it's the operation that's going to cure, but it's only going to cure uh, with the will of God. And that balance, I think, becomes our, the correct attitude, um, not only to actually mental illness, but to physical illness, so let's investigate the, um, the Rambam. And the Rambam starts off talking about general bad things that, that might happen to you. What is the correct response um, at times when things are very, very difficult? So the Rambam says, it's a, um, Evelyn, let's go back to you. Evelyn, I'm whisking you back 700 years. This is a positive commandment from the Torah 
to cry out and to sound trumpets for all troubles that come upon the community. As it is stated, Numbers 10, 9, upon an enemy who attacks you and you sound trumpets. That is to say, with every matter that troubles you, such as famine, a plague, locusts and that which is similar to them, cry out about them and sound the trumpets. Right. So the correct response to a plague, part of the correct response is to cry out, to, to say that this, that this is really bad um, and we're suffering and could Hashem do something about it? And in the next little section, the Rambam goes on further. He says, And this is an opportunity for us to um, get some kind of silver lining from bad things, because if we think, if, if we allow it to be a cause of reflection and thought, then maybe it will take us to, to a better place than we, we started at. But what he doesn't say, and it's really important, he doesn't say that when a plague or when bad things happen, you're going to find out the cause of it, rather like the vision of Sareva, who knew that the virus is about um, technology. The Rambam doesn't like that idea at all. He doesn't mention it at all. The Rambam is very eager that it's a trigger for reflection. But you're never going to understand the spiritual causes of these things that happen. Um, you can't blame it on anything. You can't identify any one thing. Take the opportunity to reflect. And if you don't reflect, then you're denying that there is a spiritual co component. And that's, um, that's, he calls that wicked. Um, take the opportunity, but don't blame the event on anything specific. So... The Rambam, in his approach, is very reliant on a Mishnah we're very, very familiar with. It's a Mishnah that we say every Friday night in Bameh Madlikin. And the Mishnah in Bameh Madlikin says the following. Hamachabe es hanen. It's Friday night and you've got a candle on. And now you identify that it might be dangerous to keep the candle lit. On Shabbat, you're not allowed to put a candle out. But hey, the Mishnah says you can. If you're scared, because there are anti-Semitic non-Jews who are threatening and you want to try and give the impression you're not there, you put the candle out. If there are robbers around, put the candle out. And here the, the Mishnah is a little bit enigmatic. If there's a bad spirit. So some of the commentators say bad spirits are ghosts and demons. The Rambam doesn't live in a universe of ghosts and demons. He doesn't have that at all. And he's going to use this idea that you can break Shabbat in order to save someone from a Ruach Ra to be his opening salvo in his approach to, um, in, in his approach to mental illness. So here's the Rambam in his commentary on that Mishnah. So he quotes the Mishnah that you can put the light out if you're fearful. And then he immediately tells us what he thinks a Ruach Ra is, what a bad spirit is. So Ruach Ra, Korin Lechol Mine HaCholin, it's that classification of illness, Hanikra Ba'aravi, which in Arabic is called Malkonia. Well, the Rambam was uh, slightly wrong in two things. First of all, it tells us that the Rambam had no direct access to Latin, because if he did, he would know that the word is melancholia, not malconia. But it clearly is what we would call melancholia. Um, uh, he only has access to it through the Arabic. And that's actually uh, an important issue with the Rambam, who is very dependent on Arist his understanding of Aristotle, but his understanding of Aristotle hasn't come through Latin or Greek, it's come through Arabic. So here he's telling us that if someone is suffering from this thing called melancholia, it's as dangerous as, as anything else. It's a real illness. There's no, don't say to Hillim, don't um, take the person to the mikvah, put the light out because that's going to help them. And you can break Shabbat to help someone with such an illness. So it's, he's, 
he's flipping everything else we've seen so far on its head. Here he is writing in the 12th century, probably, and he's uh, definitely sorry, and he's telling us to be as scared of mental illness as we are of anything else. And now he's going to give us more detail. Some of the, um, some people, when they have this kind of illness, that the person wants to run away, and they want to get away from human society, and if they see light, or or if they're forced into having company, being company with people, it's really, really bad for them. However, but they will calm down. If you can get the light out, that will have a calming effect. And if they can be left alone, at the time when they are particularly um, um, in trouble. Vahadava has a, and it's not only melancholia, it's also nimsa habe babale hamarot. And so he's, re, he's relating that to the medieval understanding of our psyche, that we have various um, fluids wandering around our body, and each one contributes to different sorts of, of mood and mood changes. It's a really important statement in the developing attitude that we have. And obviously, it's one that's very much ignored by, for example, Rav Nachman, because Rav Nachman would say, it's the devil who's making you, who's giving you all this trouble. And what we're seeing here is the Rambam saying, no, it's an illness, and it's an illness like any other illness, and you can fix it by putting the light out on Shabbos, put the light out. So that's the Rambam's opening position. Now, I've given you, I'm not going to go through this whole text, but I just wanted to show you the pattern of the page when the Rambam starts discussing mental illness. So here we are, we're in the Mishnah Torah, which is his main halachic work, <coughs> and we're in Hilchot Deot, the laws of, um, I think it's translated as human dispositions, but it's human characters, it's the laws of personality, what may all... The laws of psyche, maybe, what makes up uh, uh, an individual. How, we, how do we achieve psychological equilibrium? Don't expect anything uh, amazingly modern. Um, this is being written, as I said, in the 12th century. However, there are certain aspects of it that are absolutely radical and striking. And the first thing that's unbelievably radical and striking is the, what we see a huge amount of text. So the middle text that I'm showing you here is the Rambam. It's always accompanied by the commentary of Rav Yosef Cairo, which is called Kesef Mishnah. That's, if your eyes are up to it, that's what's going on over there. So we have a massive amount of Rambam talking about human personality and human psychology. The role of, of Rav Yosef Cairo is to tell us where did he get this from in previous Jewish texts. Is it a Gemara? Is it a Mishnah? Is it a Tasefta? And normally you would expect this kind of amount of information in the Rambam to be accompanied by a huge whack of Kesef Mishnah telling this comes from here and that comes from there and this is a Mishnah and this is a Gemara. There is nothing. The Kesef Mishnah gives up after two lines and why? because the Rambam here is going absolutely off-piste. He's going to tell us stuff that isn't based in prior Jewish texts. He's going to tell us stuff which are very, depend very dependent initially on Aristotle, but also on his own insights. So this is the Rambam at his radical, you, you may think it's his best or it's his radical worst. He's absolutely applying his intellect independently without having to, not worrying whether, where did you get this from? What's the, what's the source for this? So that's the opening page. And I can, you can have a look at the rest of the pages. So this is the next page. Um, and you want to find the Kesef Mishnah, who tells us the sources. The Lechem Mishnah is only giving us clarifications. But the Kesef Mishnah, gone. Not there at all. In other words, 
for everything we're seeing on this page, there are no Jewish sources. On to the next page. And now we're quite deep in, and we have, again, a huge hunk of the Rambam talking psychology. Kesef Mishnah is up here, and we get the benefit of four and a half lines. In other words, the Rambam is still going solo. The Rambam is still working things out himself and coming up with radical responses. Um, so let's have a look at what the Rambam says. So this is, the, this is uh, slightly more readable. Um, some of the material which the Kesef Mishnah, uh, um, Rabbi Yosef Cairo, who after all is the author of the Shulchan Aruch, a great admirer of the Rambam, and he's thrown up his hands. He says, I don't know, I've got no idea where this is coming from. So the Rambam is talking about the Derech HaYishara, what is the straight way in which we can organize our minds and keep to some kind of psychological equilibrium. And following Aristotle, he's very much in favor of um, uh, a golden mean, a, a middle path. That's not our topic for today. But, but he says at the end, if you manage to follow this path of equilibrium in your, um, between anger and calmness, jealousy and disinterest, um, courage and recklessness, um, if you can manage to move, position yourself to be balanced, that is called derech chachamim. That's the thing that chachamim get up to. Now, he's going to tell us that Chachamim are not Rabbanim. That there's a specialist type of person who's called a Chacham, who is unusually gifted in understanding um, what's ha what... Um, sorry, let me get rid of that. Um, who's unusually gifted in trying to... Um, in trying to help people who are, are suffering from mental illness. Anyone who's managed anyone who's managed in his own life to create balance in his personality and balance in his psyche, that is what a chacham is. So, so it's the wise men, not the rabbis. And just in case you think I'm doing rabbis down, we can now have a look at this next section. Um, so he starts off explaining what physical sickness is, and then he moves into um, even so are people whose souls are sick. So the Hebrew is choli nefesh, and that's clearly he's talking about um, psychological illness, um, and they've lost equilibrium, and they're not able to deal with it. What are they supposed to do? So they should go. Um, so here we have it. So Evelyn, would you read from Let Them Go to the Wise Men? who are doctors of the souls and they will heal their disease with tendencies wherein they will instruct them until they will bring them back to the right way and they that are conscious of their evil tendencies and do not go to the wise to be cured by them concerning them Solomon said wisdom and instruction fools alone despise Proverbs 1 7 so the answer to these, to these problems, says the Rambam, are people called doctors of the souls. Rofe Nefesh, it's a specialist um, thing to get involved with. And I think he's saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a Rofe Guf, a, a, a Rof, I can cure bodies, but the ability to cure souls doesn't come, it's not related to being a Talmud Chacham, it's not related to being um, a spiritual person at all. Spirituality is not going to give you an insight into psychological disorder. But it's a specialist thing, and even in the 12th century, the Rambam identified a class of person who was a doctor of the soul who specialized in this area. 
So the Rambam is following on from what he said, that, you, that mental illness is so real that we're allowed to break Shabbat for it. And now it's different. It's certainly not spiritual illness. And it's even different to physical illness. And we require specialists in the field. So I want to show you how, and I, this, you can see from the, from the material I showed you early on, which was uh, obviously prejudiced and took a very um, unacceptable view towards psychological illness, that that's current today in the Jewish world. The Rambam 800 years ago was absolutely clear that mental illness is an illness and is not cured by any kind of spiritual activity and is not available to spiritual people to cure. We have uh, a spiritual person has no greater insight into mental illness than maybe even a dustman. It's a specialist person who's got to fix it. Now that becomes, um, and thank God, the Rambam becomes the norm in the kind of circles we may move in and becomes this idea of treating mental illness as such as psychological disorder, not in any way tinged with spiritual disorder, becomes very important in the halakha. So this is a question that was asked of Rabbi Eliezer Waldenburg. Now, Rabbi Eliezer Waldenburg has got a track record in, in this area, which I'll explain in a second, but who was he? He was the Av Bet Din of the uh, Bet Din HaGadol in Yerushalayim, the, the central Bet Din. And uh, he's one of the few people that really nearly everyone liked. And he was considered to be a very important figure. Um, one of his most famous chuvot was on the question of aborting Tay-Sax babies. And he, his argument was that the psychological distress of a mother giving birth to and living with a Tay-Sax baby was so awful that we should abort. Now, other rabbis, including Ramosha Feinstein, were, were, were horrified at that. But nonetheless, I, I think he's, um, most people now would follow his advice that we really got to consider the psychological health of a mother. And that psychological health is not going to be assuaged by any amount of saying to him or wise rabbis. It's only going to be assuaged by aborting the, the baby. And that because mental illness is real. That's what we have to do. This is a different tshuva. This is a tshuva asking whether if you've gone through mental illness and you've come out the other side, is it appropriate to say birkat ha um, So, um, and he, in this tshuva, he makes it very clear that he considers mental illness as serious as physical illness. And the relief that someone comes through it and comes out the other side, it's hugely appropriate to say Birkat HaGomel. And that's in the spirit of this balance that we're saying. To get cured, you go to psychologists and psychiatrists. But like Moshe Valach, you, you also thank God. You do an operation, but you say to him to ask that it should go well. There is, an, uh, uh, there, there is a dual parallel causality. There's the causality of illness and we need to deal with it and respect it as such and not interfere and not allow rabbis to, to give their opinions. It goes to a specialist, Jewish, non-Jewish, makes no difference. It goes to the best doctor in, in the field. And here we have um, Rav Asher Weiss is still alive. Oh, I said it like he's, he's decrepit. He's He's, he's very, um, very up and running. Um, and he had an interesting case. He has a student who's very from, but is suffering from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and is unable to get to the end of a bracha or end of the Shema without reflecting on the terrible way that he said it and determines to go back the whole time and non-halachically try and repeat it before he's finished and go back again and go back again and go back again. So the question is, should we allow him to do that or, um, or not? Uh, when did Rav Waldenberg live? Um, I'm pretty sure he passed away um, no, uh, in the 1990s. 
Um, so, um, and uh, unfortunately, if you want to acquaint yourself with his works, I think they're up to volume 24 of his Chuvot. So it's quite a, um, for those people who like reading authors at the beginning of their, uh, their careers, you've missed out on the Tzitz Elias on Rabbi Feldenberg. Um, but um, here's Asher Weiss, who's a um, very popular person amongst the, particularly amongst the English speaking um, students and uh, families in, in Yerushalayim. And he comes to London on occasion and is a, is, is, is a, is a dazzling speaker. And, um, but his response to this whole problem is, is quite amazing. So you've got this person who keeps on wanting to repeat to be able to say God's name, to be able to say it right. And he's breaking the halakha every time he tries to say, um, to, to, to say uh, a bracha, because he's not going to finish, he's going to go back, he's going to repeat words. So what do you do about such a person? So he says, you go and ask a doctor, you don't ask me, and you ask a doctor, according to the doctors who are experts in conditions, the treatment is never go back in prayer. And if he does not feel he has said the prayer properly, he should not make another try. In other words, even if he's, he's convinced he's messed it up and he hasn't said the bracha, plow on. You've got to convince him to, to, move, to move on. In other words, the halachic consideration, did he say it, didn't he say it, say it falls away. And the medical consideration is the only one we're, we're interested in. In this way, the doctors hope to save him from his distress. It is the halakha that the first obligation that a person has is to whatever is required to find healing from this illness. And for this, it is even permitted for him to bypass and not do mitzvot in, in the Torah. And now, of all people, he quotes the Chatam Sofer, who has a reputation for being, let's say, very conservative and very traditional. And on this matter, the Khatam Sofa wrote of a child deemed to be insane and asked whether it was permitted to send him to an institution where they'll take care of him and there's a chance of healing him and he may become okay. However, this institution has non-kosher food. And uh, the Khatam Sofa didn't hesitate for a moment. He said, he's ill and we need to heal him. And how do we heal this person? We heal him by sending him to this institution. So... I, I, I hope I've convinced you that um, uh, whilst there is a, a, a slightly strange tendency, uh, particularly in the traditional Hasidic world, to treat mental illness as being something somewhat different and something which is treatable through spiritual means, the mainstream, thank goodness, inspired by the really radical position of the Rambam telling us in the 12th century that there were Rofei Nefesh, that there were psychiatrists, psychologists out there who specialized, even though they're not Tamir Chachamim, they're just experts in the field, and those are the people you need to go to. And certainly the halacha is established today that rabbis take a, should take a step back and let the best um, professional deal with, every, eh, 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 with such a thing, even to the extent that Chatam Sofer said, send a child to a place where they don't have kosher food if there's a chance, a chance of healing. Um, so I'm going to stop there and ask if there's any questions. Um, ne Nemi, how are we going to conduct this? Um, okay, thank you, Michael. I think if anyone has any questions, could they physically raise their hand, wave it in the air? And I'm hoping Rabbi Portnoy uh, will see you and unmute you. So if anyone has questions, just wave your hand in the air. I can't see any, no, unless you can. Ah, I was totally persuasive. Um, okay. Are there any questions? Or uh, Rabbi Portnoy, can you see anyone? Seeing as most have their videos switched off and the ones that have the videos on, no, they're on. No. Michael, you're totally persuasive as usual. <laughs>
Okay. okay. In, in that case, Michael, thank you as always for a very interesting, insightful, thought-provoking share on understanding med uh, mental health for Jewish sources. Um, it's a very topical subject. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Portnoy, for your help uh, with the logistics this evening. Uh, thank you for Eve, to Evelyn for reprising her role, as, her tea and Torah role as Michael's reader. Um, there's a couple of announcements. Uh, next week, Rabbit Senya Al Hamer will be our guest speaker. I don't have a title yet, but we'll send it out during the week. Uh, before finishing, can I mention a rally close event taking place on Tuesday this week at 8 p.m. on Zoom? Rabbi Stephen Weil, Senior Managing Director of Orthodox Union in New York, will be in conversation with David Karuna. Details obtain obtainable from uh, our short office. Um, thank you all very much for joining us this evening, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Can I just say that people have asked, is this available on uh, Inspire? It is, um, but I'll need to share it. So if you've, if you've asked that question in chat, I'll send you the link directly. Um, and if there's any other questions in chat, I'll, I'll answer them over the, over the next couple of hours. So thank okay, you very I, much. I can see a lot of thank yous in chat. So. Ah, okay. There you go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks. Good night, Thank everyone. you all for coming. See you next week. Wow. Well, um, I'm about to go. Bye, Nay. Nice okay, bye. You. Thanks. <laughs>